Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Coming up on America's Heartland, what does it take to succeed when it comes to agriculture? Let's introduce you to some very special people whose unique approaches to agriculture have made them successful farmers and ranchers. We'll visit a New England apple orchard where city folks are the secret to this rural farming operation. Travel to North Carolina for a goat ranching roundup. Meet a California farming family using solar energy as part of their plan to protect the environment. And a Utah family finds success with ranching and recreation. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. America's Heartland is made possible by Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following. close to the land. Thanks for joining us on America's Heartland. If you're a regular viewer, you know that we like to introduce you to folks in the heartland who take a creative approach to making sure that their farms or ranches are successful. That means trying new things that benefit both their land and the bottom line. Technology has played a major role in those success stories. GPS satellite systems have made it possible for farmers to use their equipment more efficiently. That saves money on fuel and also allows them to be more precise when it comes to fertilizers and pesticides. Computer software has provided the means for farmers and ranchers to adapt to changing conditions like weather, putting water resources where it's needed most, or adjusting schedules for planting or harvesting. But success depends on other things as well, like creative marketing when it comes to interacting with the public. We'll give you a couple of examples a little bit later on, but let's start in Northern California. Jason Schultz introduces us to one farm family who says success comes with understanding your relationship to the land and the environment. Today we're harvesting a field of medium grain and uh, we're right in the middle of a 150 acre field right now that we hope to finish today. The fall rice harvest is in full swing, just north of Sacramento, California. Al Montna and his daughter, Nicole Montna Van Vleck, have a decision to make. The moisture level in the rice is a little high, so they may need to wait to complete the harvest. Because of that, maybe coming back Saturday or, or, you know, or maybe through the weekend to Monday. What might seem like a minor detail can have a larger impact on their bottom line. Higher moisture means longer drying time for the rice, and that translates into higher costs and less profit. It's the kind of decision that requires gut instinct and a keen knowledge of their crop, handed down from generation to generation. Montana Farms has been in this region since the late 1850s. Uh, my grandfather was a French immigrant. It was a farm laborer and became a walnut and tree farmer. And he had seven children and one of those was my father. And he became the first rice grower in the family in the 1930s. And that heritage has now come to me and to my family. Preserving that heritage has prompted Al to focus on the future. Environmental efforts like new solar panels save energy in running the farm's huge drying facilities. And the family has made a commitment to protecting the wildlife that shares their fields. I think the, the thing we're, we're most proud of, I'm personally most proud of, is our, is our commitment that we've made to waterfowl and, and migratory birds. Because I've seen the great success story of this region going from some birds to now and at times uh, hundreds of thousand birds in this, in this region. What's in the field here today are white-faced ibis, and when I came to the ranch, I never saw them. 
very, very rarely. Now they're here in colonies. They're hard to move off. I, I'll send the dog or the kids off sometimes to see if we can move them along, and they just move to the next check, and they really enjoy it here. You came back to the farm 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the, and essentially around the same time that the birds started coming back, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, these especially, this species in particular, has seemed to really flourish in the last 20 years. Farmers flood the rice fields after harvest to break down the remaining rice straw. Those fields provide food for birds. That has attracted the attention and support of environmental organizations like the Nature Conservancy and Audubon Society. It also brings out bird watchers to catch a glimpse of rare and beautiful wild birds. Rice fields have largely replaced traditional wetlands in California. We've lost more than 90% of the original wetlands in our state. So rice fields now operate as surrogate wetlands to more than 200 wildlife species. Millions of ducks and geese and many other species that utilize the flyway rely on rice fields for food and a resting place. A severe statewide drought has meant reduced water flow to farmers like the Montnas. This year, the family isn't able to grow rice on a third of their ground due to the cutbacks. Historically, agriculture in California has used 80% of the state's water supply. And as usage across the state is scrutinized, farmers are forced to demonstrate the benefits of their usage beyond the harvested crop. We are providing jobs and jobs in these communities where rice is grown is so vital because in, in counties up here like Sutter County, uh, Yuba County, which is next door, Calusa County, up the street, Butte County, rice is almost 50% of the economy. Those towns would be hit very, very severely, those little towns that are dotted up and down Highway 99 and I-5 by the lack of a rice crop. Beyond that, this habitat value. In a normal year, if you have 300 of the 500,000 acres flooded for the ducks and geese, that provides food for those ducks and geese, 60% of their food. They would run out of food in a normal year in January. If we don't have water this winter for the ducks and geese to help decompose the straw, it doesn't provide the habitat, it doesn't provide the food. So they're gonna run out of food even sooner, which makes them, you know, the viability of the flyway puts that in question without enough water. As Al Matna hands the farm management to the next generation, the family's environmental effort is a large part of ensuring their success. The reins are being passed to Nicole as we speak. She runs this company, and I'm very proud to be the coach. And her sister is also involved. I drive up and down these roads and I point out to my family, you see that family's name on that so street sign? You see that one? They're gone. And we're hopefully not going to have, have that happen to our family operation. It's, it's almost impossible to describe the pride that we have about the legacy of passing this on. California, along with Arkansas, is a major producer of rice, much of it headed for markets overseas. Rice is critical to the world's food needs. Billions of people include rice in their diets every day, and rice is an essential ingredient in making beer, wine, animal feed, and cosmetics. I mentioned earlier that creative marketing is one of the reasons that some operations are successful. That's a key ingredient for all of those big name companies whose products you see on the shelves at your local supermarket. But it's also important for smaller farmers. Consider the story of one New England orchard that depends on city folks to ensure the success of their rural operation. From Gravenstein to Golden Delicious, Macintosh to McCoon, with 40 different varieties, this may well be New England's epicenter of apples. Welcome to Applecrest Farms in New Hampshire. On this brilliant fall weekend, thousands of apple lovers are gathering to enjoy some guitar and banjo picking, then heading to the orchards to do a little picking of their own. Go slow, pick the good ones. I am. This is actually my third time here. And this is my first time for riding a pony. 
from pony rides to pumpkins to pie eating contests to stuffing your face with roasted corn on the cob or stuffing a scarecrow. It's all part of the yearly Apple Pressed Fall Festival, an event dating back nearly four decades. This land that you see has been farmed for hundreds of years. Todd Wagner grew up on Apple Crest Farms. It was purchased by Todd's grandfather back in the 1950s, but its roots go back to 1913, when a New Englander named Walter Farmer planted the very first apple trees. These trees that you see here were part of the original planting back in 1913, so 100 years and still, as you can see, like a pretty incredible crop. That's a nice crop in here. Look at the size of those apples. Though Todd and his dad Peter grew up here, both spent years away from the farm. Peter in business, Todd as a filmmaker. But something drew them back to a lifestyle they missed more than they knew. My wife and I thought about it uh, and said, that's not a bad way to bring up a family. It's not a bad way to live a life. Being outdoors and doing what you want to do and feeding the world with apples. I live in the house that my grandparents lived in and I like that connection to the history. And it gives you a sense of place and it's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. What are 25? Continuing the agricultural tradition of Applecrest Farms means adopting new strategies and finding ways to profit beyond simply growing apples. The Wagners still produce thousands of bushels for retail sale, but actually reduced the size of the orchards, replanting many acres with two dozen different kinds of fruits and vegetables. In addition, it meant growing their agritourism business, Things like their fall festival. I can't imagine my grandfather or grandmother could have ever have imagined back then. The, those festivals are really what keep us afloat. Like most pick-it-yourself farms, Applecrest has some food favorites that draw folks back every year. Cider donuts made fresh daily, homemade ice cream, fresh apple cider, and oh, those apple pies. I think it's just like a second home to me. Yeah, I've been here forever. Meet Evelyn Tuttle and Gertrude Eaton. The sisters haven't really been here forever. Just 60 years for Evelyn and 45 for Gertrude. Talk about roots. Their dad was Walter Farmer, the original owner who planted the farm's first apple tree. So do you eat pie at home? No. <laughs> Probably we should say yes. <laughs> Gert and Evelyn. It's incredible what they do. They're intricately entwined into the fabric of this farm and this land, and um, they give their heart and soul to this place. Good job. Such loyalty and longevity aren't hard to find here on the farm. Yeah, Chris has been, this is year six? Six year oh, here. Wow. As the Wagners celebrate their farm centennial, they cherish their own family bonds and celebrate traditions they help other families create. We have a couple of people who have been engaged, they were married here, and now they bring their kids here. We've got grandmothers with their kids and their kids. We've, we've had four generations before. And they all say thank you. They say thank you for still being here. Thank you so much. And that's our intention. That's what, I mean, we want to be here. We want to be here forever, and that's uh, it's a hard thing to say. Forever is a long time, but that's, uh, we want this farm to keep on going. Want to learn a new word? The science of growing apples is called pomology. The bright red fruit is fat-free, sodium-free, and cholesterol-free, with a medium apple weighing in at only 80 calories. And did you know that apples are a member of the rose family? Let's take you to North Carolina for another example where positive public feedback has made a difference in their successful farm. In this case, it's all about award-winning cheese made from goat's milk. Our Rob Stewart says it's a farm whose owner has had to face some serious challenges in handling the day-to-day -day demands. The sun has just come up over Prodigal Farm, and more than 200 goats are winding their way in from open pasture to the barn for an early morning milking. Yes, sweetie. Come on, girls. Let's go. Come on. The goats file in one by one. The twice a day milkings to make cheese will take hours of hard work for Dave Crabby and Catherine Spann. 
partners on this land and in life. This is Coraline. Yep. She and her sister Miracle were some of the original 20 dolings that we got when we decided to found the dairy. Cat Span knows each of her goats by name. I do know all their names. That's Miss Edwina, who thinks she's all that. Cat Span is all that. The former New York lawyer is now a goat guru. Cat and Dave left urban careers to return to Cat's native state of North Carolina, hence the name Prodigal Farm. Goats roam free on some 100 acres of sustainable farmstead land. Well, farmstead means that we produce 100% of all of our own milk on our farm. We really feel it's, it's the quality of our milk that, that allows us to produce you know, the best cheese possible. We're self-taught farmers, self-taught cheese makers, and um, we say it sort of gives us an advantage because uh, it allows us to think outside the box. Our goats are really engaged with people, um, very drawn to people because they've only had good experiences with people. Um, but they're also alert, engaged in the world around them. That world around them, while tranquil, is busy with 80-hour work weeks. The goat's milk is moved to the cheese making room, churning out a highly prized product. These little darlings are a cheese that we call Hunkadora, and they have been aged for about two and a half weeks. They are based on a French style that's called Celle Sur Cher. Um, it's sort of regional, but it's our tweak on it. The European style cheeses ripen from the outside in, developing a more complex flavor as they age. This is the point at which I really like to send them out. And they're obviously an artisanal product. They're not some cookie cutter product. If I hold on to this, I think first of um, the animals that it took to produce milk that people have consistently commented is some of the best in the industry. But this also represents my vision for a cheese that competes favorably with foreign cheeses. And we're really producing, as a country, some amazing artisanal products. The Prodigal Farm cheeses have gained a national reputation. They've even been served at the White House. For your law career, you went to college and three years of law school. You worked for federal court judges in New York City. You've done the gamut to learn the law, but the land? You actually have highlighted something that um, initially made me very tentative. When I came out of law school and then I passed the bar exam, somebody told me, you are a lawyer now. Right. And you are empowered to be a lawyer. And I feel like farming is really an ancient and honorable profession. And I was really bashful for a long time. I felt like I didn't deserve to be called a farmer. Um, you know, I had to, I felt like I had to earn that somehow and nobody was gonna tell me when I was there. But while Kat has found success in her new professional life, she's also faced challenges in her personal life. Last fall, I was diagnosed with um, stage three breast cancer and started first chemo, then surgery. Now I'm doing radiation for that, um, all of which is very time consuming. And it's a lot of downtime in a, um, a business where dairy doesn't wait, milk doesn't wait, the cheese making doesn't wait. But you, know, you still have to get up and keep putting one foot in front of the other. You don't have a lot of choices. Okay, one so choice she has made is becoming a voice for the nation's rural farmers. That's included addressing North Carolina legislators on farmers' rights. Farmers really are out of sight, out of mind a lot of the time. And in a more and more urbanizing society, um, what it means to have the farming lifestyle and what the problems are that impact farmers. This year, going to close on a conservation easement on our farm, which means we will um, sell and donate the rights to develop this land further, so it will be farmland forever. It's kind of inconceivable to me to do anything different. Um, you know, to a certain extent, I think this is true of dairy farmers everywhere. You know, you know, to get up in the morning as the sun comes up and somehow keep going until you feel like you're going to drop it at night. And you just get up and do it again the next day. And we very much view ourselves as um, custodians for a time of something that will continue after us. Goat's milk is the beverage of choice in many countries around the world. And goat's milk is used for drinking, cooking, and baking. 
You've probably had cheese made from goat's milk, but if you want to sample something different, there are products using goat's milk for butter, ice cream, yogurt, even candy. Like any other business, agriculture demands that you adapt if you want to stay profitable and stay in business. Having their land do double duty was not something that one Utah family had in mind. But being successful meant that they had to look at their natural resources in quite a different way. Our John Lobertini says the solution was a combination of ranching and recreation. The stunning views across Park City, Utah speak for themselves. The mountains, the blue skies, the red rock cliffs. Okay, well, how you doing? But rancher Steve Osgathorpe is changing the dialogue about working the land in this outdoor paradise. We saw what was happening in the Park City area. We were either going to have to, to get out, out of agriculture, sell our property and leave, but there was no other place we wanted to go and we didn't want to be driven out. Driven out by tourism. By the early 1990s, this old mining town was becoming a playground for the rich and famous. The Osgathorps didn't know much about outdoor recreation, but they did own tens of thousands of acres here. Horseback riding seemed like a natural pursuit, and word spread. Actors Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy came, as did pro basketball star Carl Malone, and TV news anchors Matt Lauer and Katie Couric during the 2002 Winter Olympics. Left leg in the stirrup there, grab that horn, up and over. The Genco family came west from Baltimore. I was perfectly content just staying on the East Coast until uh, I took a trip out here and I was just, it's breathtaking. I had to get my family out here to come out and see it. But Park City is one of those rare places that offers something year round. Everybody's first time? No, no. no you've all been before? Yeah. During the winter months, the Osgathorps run a snowmobiling business. On a mountain course, they groom themselves. We decided we better get in the recreation mode a little and, and determine our destiny. I tell people, instead of milking cows now, we milk the public. The humor is a cover of sorts for the serious work this former dairyman is doing on the environment. It looks like you've done some work up there on that hillside. Yes, this is uh, one of the areas that was in our uh, uh, forestry management plan. Osgathorpe and his six sons are thinning the trees to make way for others, reseeding hillsides and trails, and improving the quality of the runoff that trickles down to his crops every spring. When we bought this property, it had been overgrazed, and the streams that run out of here in the spring were running dirty, and, and we knew there were problems, and we wanted to correct those problems, because we knew if we took care of it, it would take care of us. And it does. Each fall, the Osgathorps bring in sheep to graze the nearby slopes before ski season. Their flocks get fed, and the family makes another buck off the land. 28-year-old ah. Mike does it all, but his primary job is sheep. 4,000 head on various pieces of land throughout Utah. Wool prices are up and down, but lamb consistently fetches top dollar. It's kind of been a way of life. We've been you know, born into it, and some say brainwashed into it. So it kind of gives us all, all the boys and parents, a chance to, to keep it going, to keep the family legacy alive. It's a legacy more could emulate. The family also grows barley, alfalfa, corn, and wheat. But they understand enough to leave behind an occasional dead tree. It's habitat restoration for birds. Steve Osgathorpe and his family love this land. And more than ever, they want to make sure it's something future generations can manage, monetize, and enjoy. Our whole goal is to leave this land better than when we found it. Before we go, let me pass along an invitation to visit our America's Heartland website. You'll find us at americasheartland.org. We have video from all of our shows, and you can link to lots of other information about agriculture in America. 
And of course, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube as well. Thanks for traveling the country with us. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by CropLife America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following.